This is me driving a 2.5 million pound simulator. And this is an 8 million pound Formula One version. And they're so realistic that F1 teams are using them to develop their cars without ever leaving the factory. I went behind the scenes at Dynisma to see the technology that Ferrari F1 and another F1 team that I can't mention are trusting to dial in their cars before race weekends. How well these sims replicate the real world is just incredible. When F1 teams design and test new components in the wind tunnel, they plug that data straight into the simulator. They have their drivers evaluate it and if it works, manufacture the parts for the very next race. Teams are so confident in the results that they make massive decisions on the car's development based purely on simulator testing. So to find out more, I spoke with Ash Warren who spent a decade developing simulators before founding Dynisma. Today you'll find out how F1 teams use these simulators to develop their drivers and cars, the engineering behind how they're so realistic and why the teams trust the sims so much. Plus, I got to drive one. Formula One teams spend millions on simulators, and there's a good reason. With track testing now heavily restricted, simulators have become a really important part of car development. But how exactly do the teams use the simulators? Well, first, let's look at how a new component makes its way from an idea to the race car. Take a front wing, for example. The part is designed and then the testing process starts in CFD, Computational Fluid Dynamics, where engineers test hundreds of designs virtually. The most promising designs then move to have scale models made and they get tested in the wind tunnel. In the context of in-season development, the team will probably have tested a new aerodynamic component in CFD first of all, then they will have tested it in the wind tunnel. And from those experiments, they can characterize the performance impact and put that into what we call a vehicle model, which is a piece of software that encapsulates the physics of the car. But wind tunnel data only tells part of the story. Then all the data from the tunnel is plugged into a vehicle model and that's run in a simulator. However, this first sim doesn't have a driver. The software will simulate the car running on track and will give a lap time and an indication of how well the new parts are working. But computers don't care how difficult a car is to drive and they have it right on the edge all the time. They're actually too good. What teams really need to know is how these changes affect the car's behavior on track, how it actually feels to the driver. And that's where the driver in the loop simulator becomes crucial. The simulator is the place where it all comes together. The data might come from many different places, including the wind tunnel, tire testing rig, for example. And the driver is able to give feedback on the development direction that the team is taking with the car. By the way, if you've ever wanted to learn more about the details behind Formula One and motorsport, we're launching some live F1 expert-led courses. The first one about aerodynamics sold out straight away, but we'll be launching more in the new year. So if that sounds interesting, please join our waitlist to find out more. The link's in the description below. And one advantage of the sim compared to the actual racetrack is that the simulator can have exactly the same track conditions lap after lap something that's impossible in real-world testing. So engineers can understand the effect of each component change without variables like weather or tire wear getting in the way. But one of the main benefits of these sims is to understand how easy or difficult a car is to drive on the limit. The thing that the simulator tells you that a, a, a simulation, an offline simulation, a lap simulation can't tell you is how drivable is this car? How is it? Is it going to be a nightmare to drive? Are they going to drive it on, on the limit of performance or are they going to drive it much slower? You can ask questions about in what way should we develop the car? Then once a part proves successful in the simulator, it goes to manufacturing. And what I find fascinating is how much the teams trust the sims, which I suppose speaks to how accurate they are. Mostly teams can be confident that when the parts arrive at the track, they'll work pretty much as intended. Now, some teams are better at this than others, but they're all using a similar process. If they didn't have confidence in the simulator, they may end up bringing incorrect components to the racetrack. But thankfully, in teams these days, especially those who run uh, Dynisma simulators, they have excellent confidence in, in the vehicle model, 
in the simulator, in the results that they're getting from the simulator. So let's take a look at the mechanics of this simulator. This simulator is the baby of the Dynisma family, but it's still an incredible piece of engineering and it costs 2.5 million pounds. The first thing that you'll notice is the massive structure sitting on top. This is the motion platform. It's where a lot of the action happens and it's built to move in six different directions. But what makes these movements special is how fast and precise they are. The driver inputs into the steering wheel. So we have sensors on the steering wheel and on the brake. We have a brake pressure sensor and those feed into the vehicle model. The vehicle drives around in the world and has a snap over steer. We see that in the motion generator side as a change in the accelerations. Everything we do is then geared towards replicating that yaw demand. When a driver turns the wheel or hits the brakes, the sim needs to react instantly. Otherwise, the sim's movement will be behind what the driver is expecting which was one of the reasons Lewis Hamilton didn't like older sims. And that's where latency comes in. So we've got our latency down to three to five milliseconds, which is just vastly faster than anyone else uh, is able to do. In F1, in any pinnacle of motorsport, the driver's reactions are absolutely critical. So we eliminate the delay that other simulators introduce. But why is this speed so important? Well, let's say you're driving on the limit and the back of the car steps out. In a real F1 car, you feel that movement instantly and so you can correct it. But if there's any detectable delay in the movement of the simulator, the driver won't be able to control the car as well. What can often happen in a simulator that has too much latency is the driver keeps spinning out because they're trying to drive the car on the limit of grip and then the back end steps out and they don't get the cue, they don't get the movement in time that tells them to counter steer and to correct, for example, that oversteer. So that's the initial high speed motion in the sim. But let's take a look at the base of the simulator and it's this part that can move much further. This platform can move forwards, backwards and sideways and it can rotate. This model has a range of 2.5 meters of movement where it replicates braking, turning and acceleration incredibly well. And the larger Dynisma model, the 360XY, has a movement of 5 meters. These things are absolutely huge. But how does it all work? How does it know what movement to have and when? We read the current state of the system. So we have a load of sensors on the system, encoders and accelerometers that tell us where it currently is. We know where we want it to be because we want it to accelerate in yaw. And we also need an understanding of the way that the system moves. So we've, we've got a, a model, you could call it a digital twin, that we query, we ask it if we want it to accelerate in this way towards the demand, what does it need to do? And all of this movement isn't just for show. F1 teams need their drivers to experience how the car is feeling right down to the smallest detail. Although you don't have those really big accelerations, you're still getting all the information that you need to be able to drive the simulator as you would the real car. Clearly there are, there are some differences in, in what you do in the simulator versus what you do on track. And that's the key, getting the driver to feel confident enough in the sim that they can push just as hard as they would in the real car and understand how it feels on the limit. When they turn into a corner at 180 miles per hour, they need to trust that what they're feeling through the wheel and in their bodies matches reality. That way they can give clear and precise feedback in order to properly develop the car. It allows superior correlation to reality and the driver can drive the car in the same way that they do on the track. So if you're doing testing uh, with a car that doesn't correlate to what you have at track, you will be doing a load of tests in the simulator. You'll turn up at track and repeat those tests potentially and get a completely different result, which is not what you want. But there's one key challenge that engineers still haven't fully cracked and likely never will. And that problem is sustained high g-force. For the drivers, so obviously, a, you know, a simulator as, as good as it might be, so, you know, even if it's a, a system like ours that's giving a lot of really detailed feedback about what the car is doing, um, it's never going to feel the same as reality because, you know, you, you don't hit the brakes and get 5G of deceleration. A Formula 1 car pulls up to 6G under braking and around 5G through the quick corners. But even with the most advanced motion systems, simulators just can't match these forces. 
Think about it, you need a huge amount of space to move the sim and the driver in order to replicate that sustained g-force. In fact, you'd need the size of an actual race circuit. But what these sims do is give the driver plenty of rich and detailed information very quickly, so they can drive the car on the limit. However, there is still some adaptation needed from the driver. Where the driver's skill comes in is being able to translate what they feel in the simulator to what they would be feeling in, in the real car. Although, although you don't have those really big accelerations, you're still getting all the information that you need to be able to drive the simulator as you would the real car. And how the Dynismus Sim gives the most detailed feedback possible is fascinating. So as you can imagine, a driver, say it's an F1 car, you're driving along the straight, hurtling down to turn one, you may be going 320, 330 kilometers an hour, and you hit the brakes. And in the real world, what, this ha what happens is you get, say, a four, five G acceleration exerted on the driver. You get a real sudden spike up in acceleration up to a peak. To recreate these forces exactly, again, you'd need a simulator the size of a racetrack. Because in the simulator space, you would be stationary while the driver's actually going at 320 kilometers an hour towards the end of straight. Then what would happen when the driver hits the brakes, in order to give them the feeling of deceleration, you would actually have to accelerate them backwards. But there is a solution that gives the driver the feedback they require, while not needing too much space. And the driver then has to start modulating the brake pressure. What happens as the downforce comes off the car, as the car decelerates, the driver has to release brake pressure, otherwise the wheels would just lock up because there is less brake pressure. So as the driver is coming off the brakes, they may find that they get a bit of rear under rotation, for example, or a wheel locking up. What may happen then is that the driver has realizes that they have to come off the brake even more, and so you get an even bigger drop, something like this. And instead of trying to create the full G-forces, the simulator focuses on these changes in acceleration, or deceleration in this case. But thankfully, there's a trick um, that we use in simulators. We effectively use something called a high-pass filter in order to wash out the acceleration that you get in the simulator. So we end up with a trace, instead of looking like this, it brings out the really important features that drivers need to apply feedback as they're driving the car. This high pass filter, it picks out the changes and, what, and this is exactly what the driver needs in order to be able to um, operate the car on the limit. So because we're now, instead of having like this three, four, five G up here, we're operating around uh, zero, the, the simulator is effectively not moving a great deal, but you're able to pick out these important changes. So first of all, you get this, uh, this rear under rotation here, as the, as, as the tires lock up, you reduce in deceleration, and then the driver comes off the brakes a little bit more. These subtle movements are what make the simulator feel real to a racing driver. So these smaller movements were able to render very accurately in the movement of the simulator, and that's exactly what the driver needs in order to feel the limit of grip of the car. So what's it actually like to drive one of these simulators and how did it compare to the motionless but decent sim we have here in the office? Well, this one uses a real F4 tub and straight away the racing spec pedals and steering wheel give you a very realistic feeling. But the biggest thing that stood out to me is how the car reacts when you're on the limit. In the slow corners, you get good feedback through the wheel, quite similar to other high-end simulators. But it's in the fast corners where this sim shows what it can do. You can actually feel the rotation of the car building in the corner, just like you would in a real car. That means you can push right up to the limit, predicting exactly how the car is going to react. And the way that it handles curbs and braking is pretty remarkable too. As I was driving this when I was fully in racing mode, the immersion was so good that I completely stopped noticing the individual movements in the sim. You just get completely lost in the experience. I was just fully focused on the test session in hand. You feel the vibration from the curbs through the whole car. And there's even a special system that lets you feel the engine vibration. And another thing that I've never felt in a sim before was feeling the rear of the car moving around under braking. That slight little squirm as the back steps out. That's something I've never felt in a sim before. Now, I did feel a little bit queasy at first, but once we turned down the braking movement slightly, I was fine. And that's thanks to the tiny three millisecond latency between what I saw and what I felt in the sim. But the really telling thing is how quickly I could adapt 
to driving the sim. I approached it exactly like I would a real world test session and I was up to speed pretty quickly and feeling comfortable in the car. And that's always a good sign. When a driver can jump in and be fast straight away, driving right up to the limit without spinning off, you know the simulator is giving exactly the right feedback. The weight transfer also feels very natural. That initial dive on the brakes and roll when you turn into the corner was incredibly realistic. And all of these things together mean that you really forget that you're actually in a sim. So how does this compare to the sim I have in my office? Well, the first obvious difference is price. My setup costs about £2,494,000 less than the Dynisma. And for the basic controls, the steering wheel and the pedals, there's not actually a massive difference. My direct drive wheel and hoising belt pedals give quite good feedback. The real difference lies in the motion and the feedback. Where my sim relies purely on force feedback through the wheel and pedals and my vision, these systems let you feel every detail of what the car is doing. So is it worth two and a half million pounds? Well, not for my office, not right now. And I wouldn't have anywhere to film anyway. But for racing teams, especially in development focused series like Formula One, even their £8 million simulators might actually be cheap. When a single front wing could cost £150,000 to make and there are such tight testing restrictions, being able to test parts virtually before building them saves massive amounts of money and time. It lets teams develop their cars faster and more efficiently than ever before. So while the price tag might seem incredibly expensive, it's actually one of the most valuable tools an F1 team can have. If you enjoyed this video, watch this other video up here. Thank you for watching. Thank you to Dynisma for showing me around their simulators and I'll see you next time.